Good morning and welcome to Trading Hour here on CNBC TV 18. I am Hormus Fatakia. It's a good start for the truncated week. The Nifty has already made a new record high by crossing its previous levels of 22,619. It's trading at the highest point of the day now, half a percent higher at 22,626. But the same can't be said for the Nifty Bank. It made an attempt to get to its previous record high of 48,636, but fell seven points short, gave up all the gains and is now fighting to recover some of those losses and to make another attempt at getting past those previous record highs that it made in December last year. What's doing well though, the broader markets continue to gain but the gains are a little tempered this morning. The mid cap index and the small cap index both trading with gains of three tenths of a percent each. But since we began the show uh, saying that it's a very stock specific market, there are plenty of stocks that are moving around in the broader markets and that came on the back of some intense business updates that came in over the weekend after market closing on Friday. We pull up Voltas as well. That stock saw 2 million ACs that they sold in FY24. As a result, the stock is at a record high, 9.5% higher at one point, was up 13%. The same can't be said for PSU banks though. The PSU banks uh, like Union Bank, PNB all came out with their business updates. Now seeing a negative reaction on these names, 3% lower for uh, Union Bank, PNB also trading close to 2% lower. But the one stock that has been in focus since the morning is Bandhan Bank. And that stock now 5.5% lower off the lowest point of the day, mind you. But the stock remains in the FNO ban. But now it's time to say good morning to Reema Tendulkar. And she is also tracking the other big news of the day. And that is Wipro. And the company announced the resignation of its CEO, Thierry Delaporte. And he will be replaced by Wipro veteran and insider Srini Palya. Reema, good morning. They say expect the unexpected, but a surprise. Oh, absolutely. In a surprise move, Wipro has announced the resignation of CEO Thierry Delaporte from FX 6th of April 2024. He will be replaced by Wipro veteran and insider Srinivas Palya as the new CEO and managing director of the company, effective immediately. Thierry, though, will stay on till the 31st of May to ensure a smooth transition, but will step down before his five-year term officially comes to an end next July, July of 2025. Now, moving on, who is the new CEO, Srinivas Palya? Well, he is a Wipro veteran and an insider. He's been with the company since 1992, and in his tenure, he's held many leadership positions, including the president of Wipro's consumer business unit and the global head of business application services. Most recently, he was also the CEO of the Americas region, which is one of Wipro's largest geographic units and accounts for 31% of its revenue. Now, how is Street reading this development? Well, this time, Wipro has opted for an internal candidate. The last two, the previous two CEOs were external candidates, Abid Ali Nemujmala and Thierry Delaporte. And as Nomura puts it, being an insider gives him a head start compared to what any external candidate would have had. And therefore, in that sense, perhaps it's a positive. But remember, the company's had a fair amount of CEO churn and the street is going to watch for any change in strategy under the new CEO. It's unlikely we're going to get any clarity on it in the immediate term, but that's going to be an important watch point. And the assumption is that the recovery, the turnaround for Wipro to get back to industry growth rates is going to be very gradual. That said, any new CEO's job on hand in such a case will remain the same. One, it will be revived growth. You know, Wipro's growth has faltered that, has been less than that of the industry. These are the numbers as of, you know, FI23. But even in the past, Wipro's growth has lagged that of the industry. In fact, in the first three quarters of FI24, the company has been reporting negative constant currency revenue growth. The revenue has been declining. Also, Capco Business, which Theory had acquired in his tenure for close to about $1.5 billion. What's going to be the plan when it comes to that? And finally, stem the attrition. The company has seen a series of high-profile exits. You know, this is not a comprehensive list, but the latest ones were the CFO, uh, which happened in September of last year. The chief growth officer has also stepped down. So now all eyes are going to be on the new CEO, Wipro. They will be reporting their results later this month. And what will be the new strategy under CEO? Will Re Wipro be able to revive its fortunes and get back to industry growth rate? That's going to be the ask. That's going to be the key thing to watch out for. Thanks a lot, Reema, for that comprehensive breakdown 
of the resignation of Wipro's MD and CEO Thierry Delaporte and most brokerages also tracking Wipro. Uh, they have mentioned, they have maintained their cautious stance on the stock and CLSA even went on to say that it's going to be an arduous task for the new CEO to get the company back on the path of growth and turn around the company from its current situation. But not a major reaction in the stock though, just 1% lower as of now, around 480 and 22 out of the 45 analysts that track Wipro currently have a sell recommendation on the stock. But moving on to the other big news of the day, and that is Bandhan Bank, as we highlighted. The stock is under pressure of the lowest point of the day, but still 5% lower after Chandrasekhar Ghosh announced that he will be stepping down as the bank's MD and CEO when his term ends on the 9th of July. In fact, we did speak to Mr. Ghosh earlier this morning on his surprise decision, the rationale behind it, and more. Listen in to the excerpts from that conversation. 2015, I opened the bank and up to 2018, if you see that is the three years and these are the three years I have been developed the bank and keep that uh, people's trust on the bank to deposit, attract to the deposit. 22, 23, I recovered more or less in the 70% up, 80%, but not in my satisfaction has come on that achievement. 23, 24, I have been seeing that the very fantastic way has been come as a business momentum. Sleepies has controlled. And 2015, I opened the bank. And up to 2018, if you see that the three years, and these are the three years, I have been developed the bank and keep that uh, people's trust on the bank to deposit, attract to the deposit. 22, 23, I recovered more or less in the 70% up, 80%, but not in my satisfaction has come on that achievement. 23, 24, I have been seeing that the very fantastic way has been come as a business momentum. Sleepies has controlled. Bandhan Bank CEO there speaking to CNBC TV 18, the stock though in the FNO ban in today's trading session. But the other one that is outperforming this morning, as we highlighted earlier in the show, is Voltas. And that is at a record high today following their fourth quarter business update. Vamakshi is here with the details. Vamakshi, what did Voltas end up doing to cause such a spike in the stock? Well, absolutely, Hormaz. Uh, when we look at the company's uh, quarter four update, it is a very strong update that has come through. And in fact, uh, Q4, when we talk about the company in general, sees a seasonal pickup in sales. And in fact, this time around, they've managed to post a significant growth of almost 72% as far as the volumes are concerned for ACs. In fact, for the year, that is for FY24, sales uh, of over 2 million AC units were recorded, which is not only the highest ever for the company, but in fact, it is the highest ever for any brand in India. As a result, volume growth for FY24 stood at almost 35% for the company and largely this performance could be attributed to consistent demand for cooling products, the company's strong omni-channel distribution as well as the new launches that they've done. Uh, another uh, part of this piece is uh, that Voltas Beko, the home appliances brand, has also seen a volume growth of almost 52% in the fourth quarter uh, and in fact they've also managed to achieve sales of close to nearly 2 million home appliances in FY24 and the company said that they are now gearing up to further expand its retail and distribution network. In fact, uh, Prabhudas Lidada recently conducted a channel check uh, and the channel check indicated that RAC inventory levels with the uh, dealers are currently very high and this is in anticipation of a surge uh, for demand trends in summer post Holi. And in, uh, in fact, in despite the fierce competition, brands have taken a price hike which indicates that there could be some comfort on demand and in fact, Voltas 2 has reported a price hike of almost 2-3% to and despite that, the channel check is indicating that the company has gained, managed to gain the second highest market share amongst its peers. So a strong update from the company. The stock is, sur is surging to an all-time high. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. You know, keep your eye out on EPAC Durables because this is a company which is an OEM for AC manufacturers. They make the ACs and then they sell it to brands like Voltas, uh, you know, Blue Star, Daikin. So they work with, I think, seven out of the 10 large AC manufacturers. Mm. And 80% of EPAC Durables revenues comes in from manufacturing ACs 
and even its components. So the fact that Voltas's AC business is booming is also positive news for a company like EPAC Durable. It's a recent listing. Uh, it's not had a great start on the Lal Street because the issue price was 230. But this news is positive, uh, I guess, for a company like EPAC Durables because they manufacture uh, the ACs too. We'll sorry. <laughs> the trading below its IPO price. I was it's just about yeah. to mention that 230 was the IPO the price, price, and it'll be hopeful that the summer brings about some fire in the stock as well. That is EPAC Durables, and in fact, the entire AC and cooling space has been buzzing over the last few days. Pull up Blue Star, pull up Amber Enterprises. All of those stocks have been doing very well for themselves over the last week, and even in today's trading session, Voltas is up eight and a half percent. Blue Star was also up three percent. Amber Enterprises is up another three percent as well, closing in on the four thousand mark. So AC related, cooling product related stocks doing well as the summers take shape. Blue Star is now up six and a half percent at the highest point of the day now at 1450. But time for a short break here on Trading R. Up next, we get you what's buzzing in the commodity space. Manisha Gupta joins us on the other side. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Trading R here on CNBC TV 18. The Nifty continues to remain strong at 22,630 as we speak, but the PSU Bank Index is not doing well for itself. The biggest sectoral loser and only one among the two sectoral losers actually in today's trading session. Half a percent lower there for the PSU Bank Index and most of the constituents of the index are trading lower in today's trading session. Bank of Beat, Bank, uh, other than Bank of Baroda, of course, Bank of Baroda also reported its business update uh, on Friday and that stock is trading with gains of around half a percent when I last checked. So PSU banks in focus in today's trading session. But let's shift focus to the commodity space and Manisha Gupta is joining in and today we are focusing on silver. Manisha, good morning. Oh, well, yes, you know, Harmas, I've been singing all Sona and Chandi songs in the recent days and there are plenty there. And uh, the way the markets are running up is something to look at. Gold is trading at an all-time highs and so is silver now. Silver in the Indian markets is now hitting at 82,000 rupees a kg. We've seen a huge run-up come in for this one. In the global markets, of course, we are at around $28 an ounce, which is around a three-year highs. But the Indian markets have seen a big run-up, one, because of stronger buying, imports, and also the fact that the rupee has been depreciating as well. So when you look at the last one week itself, we've seen 11% of gains come in for silver and in last one month it has been a 14% of a jump in silver. Well, the all-time highs in gold definitely are supportive for the other precious metal, which is silver. And because silver is part industrial metal, the metal prices also have been doing quite well. We are trading at a multi-month highs in sense of copper, aluminum and zinc, and that in turn seems to be supporting silver also. In any case, the latest statistics show that one-third of silver that is being produced in, is going in for industrial and uh, solar as well. And that demand also seems to be increasing and that has been supportive for silver. Markets do believe that before we end this year, we could be headed to 30 to 32 dollars an ounce in case of silver prices in the Indian markets well that calculation comes up to almost 88 to 90 thousand rupees a kg so very strong going when you look at both of these precious metal prices Sona kitna sona hai, the songs that. that you mentioned, I just, our, our lyricists should also take you and also say chandi kitni chandi hai. But that, thanks a lot Manisha for joining in. Precious metals indeed, very precious this morning. And REC, the flash is coming in on your screen there. The loan book for the company for FY24 at 5.09 lakh crore is below the company's guidance of 5.1 lakh crore. There you can see the stock has slipped into the red now after that announcement. Not a major difference. But still below what the company guided. Now remember, the stock had run up significantly in 2023, almost 250%. Mm -hmm. So a bit of a negative reaction, almost leaving no room for error uh, in case of any adverse announcements from REC. But let's get you some more market opinion. And that's coming in from Sandeep Bhatia of the Macquarie Group. And listen in as we go into this short break. We'll be right back on the other side. I think uh, IT uh, is something that we like, but again, here we have to be stock specific. So we like TCS, uh, we like HCL Tech, uh, we like Persistence. So these are some of the stocks names uh, we, we saw. Wipro, as you know, has had some management uncertainty. We're cautious on that. Uh, so I would think uh, IT, if you look as a basket of stocks, uh, it depends upon what happens in the U.S. elections. U.S. elections are still a major source of uncertainty, especially in the October to December period. Uh, so if you want a big structural um, up move in IT, that will possibly happen next year, post the elections uh, coming through. It's a stock specific uh, market now. 
so HDFC had so much bad news coming in and so much disappointment and so much overweight positions. Uh, but now everyone thinks that MSCI weight width can go up. Uh, that's not happened in the near term, but eventually it can go up. The deposit growth for HDFC and some of these uh, uh, private sector banks have been better than expected, and which is the reason why these stocks rallied. If, if the rate cut cycle starts in India, I think all these private sector banks will do better. Uh, the public sector banks have already run up, uh, but they will also follow. But yeah, I think uh, the focus should be on private sector banks going forward. Welcome back. Uh, it's a good start to this truncated week. Half a percent up on the benchmark indices. Very steady morning. Uh, we've only built on that gap up opening. Sony Patnaik from JM Financial is now with us on the show. Uh, Sony, uh, morning. Um, 22,630. It's a trip, you know, it's a century plus on the Nifty. How would you approach trade and what would your stocks be? Good morning, Reema. Thank you so much for having me on the show. So we can see that aggressive put writing is uh, you know, taking place today in 22,500, 22,600 put options, which is indicating that the support is slowly rising. You know, from 22,300 to now, we can see 22,500 is also ready to act as a very good support. Uh, the total open interest for this week's uh, option chain is also indicating that, you know, 22,500 is adding very aggressively and it is about to claim that highest open interest level. So I think that's the important level support to watch out for as long as this support is uh, you know defended we can see nifty heading towards 20 to 800 23000 most likely by the end of this week and the rally can actually come from bank nifty although today bank nifty is quite muted but then it has given a very good short covering last week yesterday uh, the entire week we've seen 36 percent of short covering in bank nifty and you know it's quite strong with 48000 as a good support so going forward bank nifty 48600 a very minor hurdle above that you can see 49500 50000 levels also that can get tested if we talk about uh, stock specific uh, then you know, today we've seen we can see that auto sector are having quite a strong momentum with fresh long builder positions uh, so the first stock pick would be in maruti maruti 52 weeks high very strong fresh long builder positions good breakout on charts um, uh, from current level, you can buy any declines up to 12,600 also can be bought, keeping a stop loss of 12,400 and a target of 13,000 to 13,200 can be seen in Maruti. And the second stock is in Pidgelite Industries. Pidgelite is also looking quite strong. It has given a good option chain breakout above 3,000 level. So keeping a stop loss of 2,980, Pidgelite can be bought at current levels for a target of 3,100. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. Let's get you a corporate conversation going now on Trading R. We have with us the management of Satin Credit Care. This is on the back of their fourth quarter business update, which came last week. The company's assets under management have crossed 10,000 crore. That said, the dispersals were a bit weak, just up 0.8% on a quarter-on-quarter -on -quarter basis, and the collection efficiency declined in the quarter. We're now joined by the Chairman Managing Director of Saturn Credit Care to take some questions. Uh, morning, this is Reema here. First, um, you know, are you seeing any signs of pressure in the MFI and rural area? Uh, any early signs of that? And two, while your dispersal growth is up 0.8% on a quarter-on-quarter -on -quarter basis, your AUM growth is up 8%. Uh, so can you explain that? Is it that the tenor of the loans has increased? So I think you know, if you look at uh, you know the, uh, the thought that which have uh, right now is that there is absolutely no stress in the rural system as such. You know, uh, if you take a cue from that, I think you know for us uh, the basic uh, uh, figure to really look at is uh, what the credit cost has been. Uh, not to be too dependent on what the collection efficiency would have been, you know. Collection efficiency is uh, uh, is a is an effect of technically, you know, various other states, you know, working on the collection efficiency uh, efficiency mechanism. But ultimately, what's the credit cost? And I think, you know, we are uh, pretty much under the guidance, you know, which we had given earlier of our credit cost. You know, so uh, typically, if you really look at, I think, you know, we've been uh, uh, very good on the uh, on the asset quality front in terms of disbursements. Again, you know, uh, for us, quarter over quarter is not what we really look at. I think you know, we had given a guidance of about 25% plus. We've done, in fact, 
34 uh, percent uh, in terms of our YOY uh, AUM. You know, I think that is the more relevant figure to probably really look at, rather than you know having uh, lo uh, looking at the quarter on quarter figures. You know, so I think you know we've been able to achieve a, a, a 25 percent plus uh, growth, which is about 34 percent, and I think uh, that is what speaks of uh, how uh, the growth momentum has really taken shape. Uh, so the credit cost, which you're saying is the important metric to track, what was the number in Q4? I remember your guidance was to keep it below 1.5%. So what yeah, was the so number think, in you know, Q4? And, you know, going ahead, FI25. Uh, so for us, the guidance, we are under the guidance, you know, so I think, you know, I probably will not be able to give you the exact numbers right now because it's still under audit. But uh, definitely, yes, credit cost is under the uh, guidance which we have already given. And going further ahead for the next, uh, you know, year also, uh, you know, we had fairly given a, a guidance of about 1.5% to about 1.75%. And we are very, very uh, sure and optimistic about it that I think the credit cost will hold on within that uh, uh, within that band, you know, which we had given earlier. Mr. Singh, good morning. Thanks a lot for joining in. What about growth on disbursements, AUMs? AUM growth this time was 34%. Uh, for the full year of disbursements were up close to 30%. Do you stick to that sort of a guidance in FY25 as well? Would you be able to achieve these kind of numbers? Uh, so absolutely. I think we've given a guidance again of 25% plus, uh, you know, for this for the next year. And I think you know, we're very well uh, sure that we'll be able to achieve that guidance, you know, in terms of... Uh, uh, disbursements as well as the AUM, no? uh, it'll be there. Mm. What was your cost of fund uh, in Q4 and also the incremental cost of fund and how would it compare with the average? Uh, so cost of funds is definitely uh, again a uh, correlation of uh, the availability as well as your ratings and everything put together. Uh, we've had a, a rating upgrade uh, uh, pretty recently and uh, what we are seeing now that for us, our cost of funds are also now uh, uh, going down, uh, though very slightly as such. And I think that momentum will hold in the next year when we have a full blown for you know the whole year as such. You know to probably be there. Our upgrade happened in sometime in December, January. So I think that period was pretty. That window was pretty small uh, in terms of the cost of funds to go down. But uh, we, are, we are hoping that the cost of funds now for the whole year will probably go down. So what was the incremental cost of fund? Is there a number, sir? And how much do you think it will decline in FI25, given the upgrade? See, I can hazard a guess, you know, our cost of funds is close to about 11.5%. Uh, my own sense is at least uh, uh, we can see a, a 25 basis point, you know, going down from there. That's the bare minimum which you're trying to look at. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to do much better than that. Mr. Singh, what about asset quality? There was some deterioration in some of the lenders seen in the December quarter, including your own uh, book, if I'm not wrong. What I may not ask you for a specific number, but is there an outlook that you can share going into FY25? Do you see an improvement on that front? So asset quality, as I said, you know, my credit cost is under the limits, you know, the guidance which we had given. And the same limits continue for the next year. So there is no stress in the asset quality uh, per se as such, you know, both for the year which is uh, gone by as well as for the uh, corresponding new year which is going to come. Uh, but with, with elections coming up, Mr. Singh, do you foresee any unforeseen pressures on the asset quality with the elections coming up, uh, potentially a new government being voted into power, some decisions taken on loan waivers, etc., etc.? Are you preparing for something like that? Uh, no, I don't think so. No. So what has happened, I, the first phase is coming up in the next 10 days or so. Uh, so we have not seen any kind of a pressure in terms of a, you know the thoughts about loan waivers or anything which is putting pressure on the collection deficit. There's holding stable right now, and that's the reason why I said you know including the election period time, which is now probably going to take at least about two months. We are already you know waiting for the first phase to come in the next ten days. We are uh, seeing nothing on the ground which would affect the uh, credit cost or the uh, or the asset quality. Mm. Uh, and typically, uh, during this election period of, you know, three to four months, uh, you know, does lending slow down, you know, in just what has been, what do you expect just in the near term in terms of lending? See, the first quarter is always very slow because that's the beginning of the first quarter. You're just waiting for the results to come in, uh, for the whole year results to probably come in uh, by, by April end, you know. So typically the first, first quarter is pretty slow, uh, but we are still seeing, seeing a very strong momentum in the field, you know, and that. Uh, seeing that, you know, I think, you know, for us, we are looking at that as compared to the earlier year, we feel that, you know, this particular first quarter will also be not that slow as used to be there earlier, basically. That's the only 
I, you know, thought I can leave you uh, uh, with, you know. And FI25 growth be better than FI24 growth of 34%? Considering things are picking up on the ground, Q1, you're saying, should not be, you know, should be better than what Q1 typically is. Well, don't, don't, don't tell me to commit any numbers as such. But I said, you know, Not committing, I'm just asking you better. <laughs> Do you think it'll be better or oh, same? I, I said, I said it's, it's going to be positive. That's for sure. That's for sure. It's going to be positive, so Mr. Singh. But uh, what is your borrowing mix currently? Uh, what is the proportion that you are borrowing from banks? Uh, so for us, uh, banks constitute about uh, uh, 50 to 50 to 55 percent of our borrowing. Uh, we have a lot of uh, foreign funds, you know, in terms of ECBs and BFIs uh, who, who are there. Public market is pretty small, you know, for us. But I think that the major share is with the uh, uh, PSU banks. Uh, as well as private banks, you know, but they constitute about 55% uh, of us, you know. The balance comes from a mix of NBSE, which is also a very small component of uh, the entire mix. Uh, but uh, there's a lot which is coming in from, uh, 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 in terms of ECBs, NCDs, from uh, foreign DFIs, you know, uh, uh, which are there as our, uh, as our lenders, you know. Uh, just one final question. What will be driving the NIM movement for you, net interest margin movement for you next year? What would be the key factors? So NIM would be, uh, if you really look at it, I think uh, asset quality probably, so we don't have too many overdues. I think, you know, that will probably also add up to this. I think, you know, for us, the growth in terms of the uh, dispersal will definitely be there. Uh, the other thing which probably we are looking at, you know, and that is there is we're trying to look at how we are able to contain our OPEX, you know, and that is probably one of the key factors which is uh, probably going to play out for the next year, you know, and we're definitely trying to look at so that we're able to have uh, maximum optimum efficiency in terms of our operations and try and see if we can pro uh, probably bring the uh, uh, our OPEX down from where, wherever it is right now. How much leverage do you have? How much of a lever can uh, OPEX be bringing down those costs? Where does it stand at? What's the ideal number that you'd like? See, it, it used to be, you know, uh, around 6% earlier, you know, and it came down to about 5.7, you know, uh, during the December uh, quarter. I think, you know, for us, the lever, which probably, you know, again, it extends to optimum efficiency in terms of uh, the, the number of borrowers per, per loan officer, as well as the other matrix, which is there. I think, you know, my sense is we still have uh, room to play with another uh, 30 basis point, you know, or, uh, you know, for it to probably go down, you know. But that's across spread across the whole year as such, you know. So I think, you know, we are looking at, uh, looking at the OPEX, you know, maybe in a far more deeper fashion than, than we used to do uh, practically uh, before this. All right, Mr. Singh, we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining us this morning and sharing your updates for the quarter gone by and for FY25. We wish you good luck for the new financial year. Time for a short break here on Trading R. We'll get you more on the markets and the, a lot of moving stocks on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Back with us here on Trading Hour on CNBC TV 18. The broader markets are not doing much, but there are plenty of stocks within the broader markets that are doing quite a bit. And one of those names is InfoEdge. And that stock is doing very well on the back of its business update that it shared over the weekend, where there was a significant rise in its billings. 9% higher now on InfoEdge, 61.90. Reema, what kind of update did they share? Well, very strong, you know. So Nomura has written a note, uh, you know, giving the numbers and the expectation, right? Uh, so they're saying the Nokri billings, which is a chunk, you know, more, most of their revenues, billings are up 7.2% on a year-on-year -year basis. Their expectation was 3%. And also this comes on the back of very poor Nokri billings in the prior three quarters. So Nokri billings were either flat or negative in the last three quarters, Q1, Q2, and Q3. So the expectation is that does this suggest that IT hiring has bottomed out, the weakness in IT hiring? Even the other verticals for the company, like real estate, which is called 99 acres, billings are very strong at 26.3%. Education and matrimony, Jeevan Sathi and Shiksha, their billings are up about 14.8%, again, higher than expectation of Nomura. So overall, billings too are up 10.5% on a year-on-year -year basis. And billings is an indicator of future revenue growth, right? It drives their revenue growth eventually. So uh, the numbers are looking better than what the street was anticipating. Nomura has a buy rating on the stock with a target price of 6,210. So not too much upside from 
here on. But today, of course, the stock has given a solid 9% up move. But moving on to Godrej Consumer and Nika, they're surging on the back of their Q4 updates. Mangalam joins in with the details. Mangalam. Been a good update. The company said that at a consolidated level, they will see mid single digit revenue growth with high single digit organic volume growth. The reason why organic is important here is because they had acquired uh, the consumer brands from Raymond, that is Park Avenue and Kama Sutra as well. So if you add both of them on a consolidated reported basis, the volumes would be double digit. In India, which is uh, the mainstay of their business, they saw high single digit volume growth again on an organic basis, which was spread uh, evenly across both their home care and uh, hair care along with beauty, personal care, verticals. Importantly, uh, you know, in a slow category like uh, household insecticides, their new launch of agarbatis has been doing extremely well. So that's a positive. There was some seasonal weakness that we saw in household insecticides. Uh, for their other verticals, which is Indonesia, the uh, next most important geography from India, after that, they've seen, uh, you know, double-digit revenue and volume growth out there as well. So that's a positive. In the Godrej, USA, Africa and Middle East areas, the African business actually was impacted by the Naira currency devaluation as, as a result of which that vertical is likely to report double-digit revenue decline on a translated basis. The margins of the company will expand and that's something that the street likes in a sector which is past for growth. Same is the case for Nika as well. In fact, their fourth quarter gross merchandise value has grown in early 30s at a consolidated level. An equal amount of growth between, uh, you know, their beauty and personal care as well as the fashion business as well. BPC net sales have grown in mid-20s, which is ahead of the industry as for the company. Fashion as well has uh, seen mid-20s sort of growth. So that's a positive. And the other verticals, which is Nika Man and their EB2B vertical, has actually seen growth of around 80%. So on the top line, there has been growth for Nika and uh, Godrej Consumer as well, far ahead of the industry. Thanks a lot, Mangalam, for joining in there. 5% higher for Nika. Positive, <coughs> sorry, positive updates coming in there for the stock. And the same goes for Godrej Consumer as well. Challenging operating environment is what they highlighted, but they still expect volume growth to remain robust as well. But the other two pair, the other pair of stocks, that are in focus is Vodafone Idea and Indus Towers and Vodafone Idea finally completed that long-awaited promoter fund infusion exercise in uh, over the weekend of two, over 2,075 crores and in lieu of that Indus Towers is also surging in today's trading session 4.5% higher now at 330. Reema, potential MSCI inclusion as well now Indus Towers? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's a two-part news. One, the Vodafone Idea news is positive, right? Vodafone Idea promoters are capitalizing the company by about 2,075 crore rupees, which strengthens Vodafone Idea. Therefore, the money that Vodafone Idea owes to Indastars can potentially come down. And plus, once maybe Vodafone Idea does its uh, you know, external fundraise, they will have the money to go ahead and roll out their 5Gs, which means that you need towers that Indastars. So that's on the business side. But there is another update, which is on MSCI, where uh, brokerages like Nubama, Alternate and Quantitative Research, they're saying that Indastars is a very strong candidate to get added in the MSCI Global Standard Index when the update happens or review happens in the month of May. And if it gets added, according to their own estimates, we could see potential inflows of about $189 million. So that's the reason why Indastars is higher in trade today. We'll get into a break on that note. On the other side, we'll put the spotlight on the financial sector. We will be joined by Motilal Oswal analyst uh, Nitin Agarwal to give us a heads up on how this quarter is likely to be. Back with us on Trading R and two stocks that we highlighted in the previous segment, some interesting data points emerging there. Info Edge was one of them. It's almost very close to Nomura's price target of 6200 for sure. But the 9% surge that the stock has seen is the best that the stock has seen in a single day since January of 2022. So big moves coming in there for Info Edge, 9.5% higher. And as Reema was highlighting about Indus Towers, the stock is up almost 60% in the first four months of the year itself. And that has led to making it the best, second best calendar year that Indus Towers has had since its listing in 2012. 60% wow. in just four months. The last time it gained was it when it doubled in 2014. So good going there for Indus Towers almost at 330. But let's now shift focus to the financial space now in a recent note on banks. Motilal Oswal Financial Services say that they expect the fourth quarter earnings to remain steady and net interest margin contractions to ease while they still remain watchful on credit costs in FY. 
FY25. To discuss more on this, we are now being joined by Nitin Agarwal, who is the head of the BFSI Research Institutional Equities at Motilal Oswal Financial Services. Nitin, good morning. Thanks a lot for joining in. What are you penciling in for the quarter when it comes to the banks? The whole host of banks have come out with their business updates. What do you make of them so far? Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning. So, uh, business updates, yes. Uh, many of the banks have reported the 4Q business updates and they have all surprised positively, especially on the deposit growth side. So, we are seeing a very strong uptick and uh, some of the banks even have reported a uptick in the CASA ratio also. So, while some of the large banks, they don't come up with business update, but uh, there is a positive read across that we are looking at for the uh, other large private banks also. And uh, which is where the hopes are uh, good that uh, you will see a stronger uh, uptick in deposits. And this will probably support a relatively better loan growth. While we are expecting a systemic loan growth to moderate in FY25, but some of the industry bodies, rating agencies, and uh, the, the viewers like that we are factoring the numbers is that will be a moderation of 200 odd basis points, which still is good enough and can get supported given the recent uptick in deposit growth that we are looking at. Uh, so, Nitin, what is your own estimate of uh, the loan growth for the industry in FY25? And with the strong deposit mobilization, you're saying there could be an upside to that. So what's the number? Yeah, uh, so as of now, we are around 13.7, 13.8 on, on the loan growth number. And this compares to 16% loan growth number in FY24. And thereafter, okay. we expect it to, to ensure to 14, 14 and a half in FY26. What about uh, the recent RBI clampdown on unsecured lending? Is that showing up in the Q4 numbers? Have you seen it? And if you could just give some examples. Yeah. So overall, there has been a moderation in unsecured loans, and uh, we will likely see banks reporting uh, a sequentially uh, moderate growth in unsecured loans, both the PL, PL and the credit cards. And uh, while banks in their business updates have not really reported the unsecured numbers separately, but that's an area wherein we believe the growth will be more measured versus how it has been in the past. And that will have some bearing on the margins in the coming quarters. You know, Nitin, in your top picks among the banking space, you have highlighted ICICI Bank, SBI and Indescent Bank. The one stock that everybody wants to know about on the street is HDFC Bank. It was The business update was pretty robust. The stock was up 7% last week, which was the best week it had since almost 2022. Is the worst over for HDFC Bank? It may not feature in your pecking order, but then that's what the street may want to know. Is the worst over for HDFC Bank? I think... Uh... The worries on HDFC Bank were uh, never to do with the earnings as such. It is more to do with as to how they align themselves with the RBI requirements on CD ratio, how well they can bring the balance sheet health back on the LCR front, wherein we think that uh, post the uh, strong quarter that they have reported, things will move in the right direction. And uh, HDFC Bank, while reporting a very strong deposit growth, have also reported a slight improvement in CASA mix. So that is a very strong number to look at. And uh, while the pace of moderation and CD issue will be more calibrated, we cannot really prorate the 4Q number because 4Q, first of all, is seasonally a strong quarter. And secondly, a lot of borrowings from HDFC Limited are non callable So therefore, bank will want to retire them as they come uh, due for maturity. And, and which is where the decline in CD issue is more calibrated, but then the journey to that has already begun. And which is where we think the valuations where HDFC Bank is looks very constructive. And that's one reason why we continue to maintain the stock as a buy. Uh, so Nitin, in Q3, the big concern was the NIM moderation. Uh, and of course, the fact that deposits were you know, quite weak, but you are seeing a pickup, aggression by uh, many banks to mobilize deposits. On NIMS, what are we expecting this time? So on NIMS, we are looking at a moderation on a sequential basis to continue. That's something that has been going on for a year. But the pace of NIM moderation will moderate. And that's what we have written as the title of the report. And uh, wherein, say, for larger banks like ICICI, we are looking at a single-digit NIM decline in this quarter. So NIMs, therefore, are now looking to stabilize somewhere. We are close to that point. But ultimately, as to how things pan out in FI25 will be a function of as to when and uh, by how much are we really cut rates. Now, uh, our house views that the rate cycle is getting a little pushed back in terms of the easing cycle. But that is something very critical when you want to form a view as to how the margins will pan out over the next one-year basis. Or on the, over the near term, I think the NIMS are like closer to bottoming out. What about PSU banks, Nitin? SBI does feature as your top pick, but a recent note from a domestic brokerage has said that 
most of these banks in valuation terms are pricing in the best case scenario and that this will recede over the next two, three years. The tailwinds will recede over the next two to three years. What side of the camp are you on, Nitin? Are valuations indeed pricing in the best case scenario or is there still more to come for these state run lenders? No, we continue to like SBI and uh, we have been overall like quite positive on the PSU space over the last uh, two, three years. And uh, while, uh, yes, the valuations have now reached one-time work, but when you look at it in context to how these banks can continue to grow, wherein we are looking at a double-digit loan growth to sustain in ROEs in very healthy to high teens, that is looking sustainable. So which is where the, uh, you will continue to get CAGR returns with these names. And the cyclicality that has always been there in the past is no longer looking on the horizon. In fact, uh, post uh, the general election results, with continuity uh, likely remaining, uh, these banks can continue to deliver very steady earnings, and which is where we uh, continue to maintain a positive stance on the sector. But within them, yes, we like SBI a lot more than uh, most other banks. Mm. Uh, Nitin, today, uh, you know, Bandhan Bank has seen some downgrades uh, post the CEO announcement. Uh, Nomura has downgraded it from a buy to a reduce. ICICI Securities saying they're under review from their ad rating. Now, I think you have a neutral rating on Bandhan Bank. How have you viewed uh, you know, the recent corporate developments and is there a chance that you would look to downgrade it? You have a neutral view, I believe. Yes, uh, we have a neutral view and we downgraded the stock in uh, 2021 at the peak. And uh, uh, so the uh, ongoing developments, the recent one especially, has come in as a surprise and uh, the stock therefore uh, naturally has reacted on, this, on that negatively. And we believe that while from the number standpoint, things are likely to trend better, but given the uncertainty around and now both the management succession as well as the audit report, which is awaited. So both these things will have an overhang on the stock performance. And uh, if, if there is no fresh negative disappointment, then given how the numbers are likely to pan out, because Bandhan has already addressed a large part of the issues when it comes to asset quality. The SMA book used to be very high double digit and that has come down to now the low to mid single digits. So there's a considerable uh, redressal of the asset quality issues. And uh, as therefore things move in the right direction and the ROAs and ROAs recover for the bank, it can see some performance. But given the uncertainty in the short term, which is why we continue with the neutral rating uh, for now on Bandhan Bank. Nitin, pleasure uh, speaking with you this morning. Thank you very much for joining in and look forward uh, to your insights once uh, the numbers start coming in. Do join us then. We will so um, move on now to the real estate stocks because they are buzzing in trade today. Uh, Sonal is here with a complete roundup of all that action. Sonal. Okay, we will get to Sonal in just a bit. We will slip into a break for now and we have an announcement to share with you. We are launching CNBC TV 18's first ever live personal finance webinar, CNBC TV 18 Accelerate Personal Finance Handbook with Sonia. She will be joined by three well-known experts on Saturday, 11th of May, 9 a.m. onwards. We'll be diving into everything you need to know to master your finances and learn how to grow your wealth, be it insurance, tax saving, managing your portfolio, retirement planning. There's lots to learn, lots to do. Whether you're in your 20s, 30s or even 40s, this live webinar is for you. We have limited seats, so don't miss your chance to register. Scan the QR code to register or log on to cnbctv18.com and we'll see you on the 11th of May. Welcome back. There are some other big movers. One of them is Exide. Uh, it's up close to about 10% in trade and it's moved up on very large volumes. And with the gain today, the stock has nearly doubled in the last one year. It's a 95% gain on Exide in the last uh, 12 months. IRB Infrastructure 2 is seeing a fair amount of buying. That stock is up close to about 4%. And you've got strength in EIL, NMDC. Zomato continues with its gains. Uh, the stock has been a steady gainer, 1.5% up 6% for the month and 56% for the year. And in the last one year, it's a 270% gain on Zomato. So the strength continues there. But back to real estate, as we promised, a lot of them are buzzing in trade. Sonal is here for more. Sonal. Never a dull day for real estate, right? So I have four stocks on my radar. Let me start with Gozush Properties. The company in an update said that they sold 1,050 homes worth over 3,000 crore rupees in their project in Gurugram, which is Gozush Zenith. And they say it is the most successful launch in terms of value and volume of sales achieved for the company as well. Additionally, they say that they have achieved a growth of 473% on a YY basis in the Gurugram geography 
in FY24 itself and they've sold inventory in, in, inventory worth 2690 crore rupees in their uh, Kandivali project in Mumbai in quarter 4. The stock is high by around 6.5%. Signature Global, uh, the company said they have exceeded FY24 guidance in terms of collections and pre-sales and that's why their pre-sales volumes are up around 111%, the value is up 240%, collections are up 71% as well. Uh, on an FY24 basis, they've been able to do sales of 7,270 crore rupees which compares with a guidance of 4,500 crore rupees, volumes of 6.18 million square feet, collections are up 62% and debt, it has uh, risen slightly at 1160 crore rupees. Keystone also, uh, the uh, update was uh, decent uh, sequentially and on a YY basis there's an increase. Pre-sales, uh, it's up 37% sequential, sequential basis, 78% on a YY basis. Collections are up 48% on a sequential basis and volumes are also up on a YY and on a sequential basis. Collections, however, are down on a YY basis. They say they launched two projects with a gross development value of 735 crore rupees in quarter 4 and 3000 crore rupees in FY24. And they also added four more projects in quarter 4 with a gross development value of around 3000 crore rupees. Lastly, India Bulls Real Estate, that big fundraise that the company has announced, uh, they will be raising 3,911 crore rupees via preferential allotment where the embassy group will get 1160 crore rupees, Bailey Gifford will get 209 crore, Blackstone will be investing 1235 crore rupees and other investors, the likes of Quant Active Fund, Poonawala Finance, there's Microlabs, Maybank, Utpal Shade and Capri Global, they will be uh, investing around 1243 crore rupees. They've also announced acquisitions of pro four projects amounting to 1853 crore rupees. This is in all cash. So some of these stocks on our radar today. Death, taxes, people buying houses and never a dull day for real estate. Some of the lists of the inevitables. Sonal, thanks a lot for joining in this morning in real estate stocks as always in action in today's trading session. And the real estate index as well, pull that up, is up 2.5% and heading close swiftly towards its record highs. It's already trading at a 15-16 year high. And the real estate index there, almost all the constituents of the index as well doing very well for themselves in trade. But let's shift focus to a CNBC TV18 exclusive global research. Bank of a firm, Bank of America, has raised its year-end target for the S&P 500 to 5,400 from 5,000 earlier. We earlier spoke to Savita Subramanian, the head of equity strategy of US at Bank of America, to discuss the recovery going ahead for the S&P 500 and India's performance in comparison to the United States. Listening to what she had to say. Our view is we're in, in for a, a broader recovery um, higher highs on the S&P, but not necessarily from just tech, but, but you know, other companies. So rates, I think, are manageable for most companies in the S&P 500. And, you know, think about it. Tech companies have net cash in many cases. So they're actually making money in this environment. I think 12 to 24 months out, we start to see the productivity gains mm -hmm. of companies like Bank of America or other service companies um, using AI to become more labor light. I think it's fintech, it's legal, it's IT services, and we've already seen this transform certain industries. If you look at the US, the white collar jobs are, are maybe more in, at risk, but within the you know kind of broader American spectrum, what we're seeing is this reshoring boom. So, you know, we've we've had a, about since 2018, we've seen companies move property, <laughs> plants, and equipment out of other regions of the world, mostly China, back to the U.S. I mean, one of the things that we looked at was, you know, what is the level of real rates that will re really destroy the economy? Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we're there yet. I mean, in fact, in the 80s and 90s, we had higher real rates than where we are today. Yeah. And the market was doing well. Companies were focused on efficiency. So if we move back to that type of environment, I think that it could be a, a still a very strong environment for equities, for the economy, et cetera. I do think that the demographic layup, layout in India is much more attractive than in the US. In the US, one of the reasons that the labor market is so tight is that we have this aging population and the, the, you know these early retirees during COVID. Um, so the demographic story is stronger here. And then I think the consumer trends in India are very exciting. Consumer trends in India are very
very exciting, exci interesting views coming in there from Bank of America. But on to news from the aviation sector now. Yesterday, Vistara announced its decision to reduce capacity by 10%, which is about 25 to 30 flights a day. Now, this comes as a part of its efforts to stabilize operations amidst challenges with the pilot shortage. According to the airline, most of these cancellations have occurred within the domestic network and alternate routes have been arranged to mitigate the inconvenience to passengers. In fact, earlier we spoke to the uh, CEO of Vistara, Vinod Kannan, and he says that unplanned disruptions could end by this week and there is a need to hire more pilots. Listen into what he had to say. If pilots do not sign up to the new contract, uh, they will not be transitioned into, the, into it and therefore into the merged entity. So it's an ongoing process. We are looking to hire more pilots. We are also looking to uh, train more pilots who are there in the system. Uh, and at the same time, when while this might take a little bit of time, that's precisely the reason why we've had to uh, have the situation of scaling back just a little bit uh, by 5 to 7 percent so that we can create that buffer not just for operational resilience, but also to perhaps provide a slightly better kind of roster for the existing pilots. So I've had discussions and town halls with each group of staff, not just pilots, with various verticals. And I think the message is very consistent and clear that this was something that should not have happened. It's uh, it's uh, unfortunate, but we are going to bounce back from this. And, and our staff can once again, you know, hold their heads high and service our customers when they come to the airport. Of course, the, uh, the changes which will have to be made are mostly through, uh, as you said, the rostering system, the practices in terms of what qualitative that we need to do in the, in the network, as well as I think the 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 uh, the approach that we've had, which is uh, which has been consultative, but perhaps we need to be a little bit more uh, open and have more dialogues and hear a little bit more from the pilots as well. And that's something which I think we will continue to do. Okay, but the reason why the Indian markets are much higher and we've had a gap up opening is also the global backdrop. U.S. markets had a rally of nearly one percent on Friday. This is after the jobs data came in much higher than what the street was anticipating. Yes, it's pushed back expectation of when the Fed is likely to start its rate cutting cycle. But the jobs data is suggestive of a very strong U.S. economy, which has the strength in itself to absorb, um, you know, the you know, just the strength of the U.S. economy. And that fueled the rally that we had in Wall Street. So, um, you know, let's uh, get in some opinion that we got on that strong U.S. jobs data and what it means for the U.S. economy. Everybody should feel pretty good about where the economy is. We've got great momentum, but we, we, it looks like we're able to have strong job growth, strong economy, and inflation gradually coming down. That's great. Uh, but we have a monetary policy which is demonstrably tight. And it's not if the economy slows down. What if we get hit by some shock and the Fed then suddenly has to cut rates a lot? The, you know, whenever the Fed has to cut rates a lot, it never works that well. So I'd rather they get on a path of gradually bringing down rates once a quarter. Nothing going on here. People you don't have to get too worried about it. Just bring rates down slowly so that we get back to a more normal level. Because frankly, the economy is performing well. It doesn't need monetary policy to be too tight or too loose, too loose right now. It was a relatively uncomplicated, strong report with a strong trend on, on payrolls. Another upside surprise relative to consensus expectations small drop in the unemployment rate, and a good increase in household employment after some weakness there. So I think on the economic activity side, this is very unambiguous, that wage numbers have been decelerating, and the month-to-month -month numbers are, you know, sometimes up, sometimes down, but the trend has been decelerating despite this strong labor market, and I think that's very encouraging for those of us who are looking for inflation to move back to 2% before too long. In one silver lining in terms of the actual data for the Fed is that the reading on average hourly earnings was quite restrained at 0.3. You know, that annualizes to somewhere in the neighborhood of 3.5% wage growth, and the Fed's not going to be overly uh, concerned about wage growth at that pace. And then the broader, I think, economic story of what we're seeing in this report is that we're seeing an ongoing shift out in the labor supply curve. We're seeing workers uh, who have returned to the labor force, and to some extent that's continuing, with a higher labor force participation rate. And we continue to see underlying indications of migration flows. 
as we call time on this edition of trading hours pull up gland pharma that has surged to the highest point of the day after the us fda drug approval that it received almost 6% higher now on gland pharma there 1857 as we speak but with that it's a wrap on this edition of trading hours from reema myself and the team that put this show together thank you so much for watching half time report takes the action forward